Over 500 million Facebook accounts could be at risk. This after a hacker released the data online for free. Facebook claims the information is old from 2019. But concerns remain around how secure personal information collected by social platforms is. The $2 trillion infrastructure plan meeting pushback on Capitol Hill, but President Biden could push the controversial package through without Republican support. And 13 states are suing the Biden administration over the $1.9 trillion relief package. That's over tax cut restrictions. Tune into Deep Dive as we explore these topics and more. Hello and welcome. This is Deep Dive and I'm Tiffany Meyer. Let's talk infrastructure. The Biden administration is geared up to pass the new infrastructure package through Congress, even without any Republican support. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm said on CNN on Sunday that while Biden would prefer to win Republican backing for the infrastructure plan, he'd likely back the same procedural strategy of reconciliation that Democrats use with the American Rescue Plan to get the American Jobs Act passed without the need for any GOP votes. Granholm suggested that the president may consider attempting to pass the legislation by using a budget process to cut out Republicans and to bypass the filibuster, lowering the threshold required in the upper chamber to a simple majority from 60 votes. Granholm said on CNN, as he has said, he was sent to the presidency to do a job for America. And if the vast majority of Americans, Democrats and Republicans across the country support spending on our country and not allowing us to lose the race globally, then he's going to do that. But added Biden would prefer his infrastructure package to have bipartisan support. So what do Republicans not agree with in the package? Senator Roy Blunt on Sunday accused Democrats of padding the infrastructure plan with unrelated pet spending projects. But he says if Biden cuts it down by 70 percent or two thirds, it would be easy to get Republican backing. Blunt called the American Jobs Act a so-called infrastructure plan that spends less than a third on transportation infrastructure and is paid for with job-destroying tax hikes as the economy begins recovering from the pandemic. He is likely referring to parts of Biden's proposal that deal with issues like climate change. Blunt told Fox News' Chris Wallace that around $615 billion of the American Jobs Act can actually be considered directly infrastructure-related adding that cutting the proposal down to that amount would win Republican backing. He says, quote, I think there's an easy win here for the White House if they would take that win, which is make this an infrastructure package, which is about 30 percent. Even if you stretch the definition of infrastructure sum, it's about 30 percent of the 2.25 trillion they are talking about spending. Adding, my advice for the White House has been take that bipartisan win. Do this in a more traditional infrastructure way. And Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is trying to pass the bill even without bipartisan support. He has asked the Senate advisor whether a second budget reconciliation could be used this year to get it done. Biden has previously called the American Jobs Act, quote, the largest American jobs investment since World War II. He said at the time, it is not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It is a once in a generation investment in America, unlike anything we've seen or done since we built the interstate highway system and the space race decades ago. Under a lengthy fact sheet from the White House, the American Jobs Act includes $621 billion to rebuild the nation's infrastructure. A $174 billion investment in the electric vehicle market with a goal of nationwide charging networks by 2030. $400 $400 billion for affordable housing, that's for elderly and disabled people. $300 billion to improve drinking water infrastructure, expand broadband access, and upgrade electric grids. $580 billion for American manufacturing, research and development, and job training. Another $213 billion to build and retrofit affordable and sustainable homes. And who's paying for all that? Biden plans to put the brunt on the American corporate world, which is expected to handle a combined $4 trillion once Biden rolls out the second part of his economic plan in April. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has signaled he is unlikely to support the infrastructure plan. He cites the massive tax hikes as the reason. He also echoed earlier remarks calling the package a Trojan horse of Democratic priorities, like tax hikes. 
He wrote on Twitter, the administration's non-infrastructure infrastructure bill looks like another Trojan horse for far-left demands. Rolling back right-to-work laws, imposing the biggest new tax hikes in a generation, killing jobs and slowing wage growth when workers need a fast recovery. McConnell noted that less than 6 percent of this massive proposal goes to roads and bridges. It would spend more money just on electric cars than on America's roads, bridges, ports, airports and waterways combined. Out of the estimated $2 trillion, just $115 goes to repairing and rebuilding bridges, highways and roads. McConnell says the tax hikes could damage the economy, hurting American jobs. Now, speaking of large bills, 13 states are suing the Biden administration over the $1.9 trillion relief package. That's because the $1.9 trillion relief package includes a provision that says states cannot use relief funds to offset decreased tax revenue that is due to any tax cuts, including by cutting rates, rebates, deductions, credits or otherwise, and any tax delays. The 13 state bipartisan coalition argue in their lawsuit the provision is unconstitutional. The states in the lawsuit are West Virginia, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Florida, Iowa, Kansas, Montana, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, and Utah. The defendants in the lawsuit are Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Treasury Department Inspector General Richard Delmer. West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey is leading the effort. He said in a statement, never before has the federal government attempted such a complete takeover of state finances. Adding, we cannot stand for such overreach. The Constitution envisions co-sovereign states, not a federal government that forces state legislatures to forfeit one of their core constitutional functions in exchange for a large check equal to approximately 25 percent of their annual respective general budgets. The lawsuit argues the provision in the relief package is one of the most egregious power grabs by the federal government in the nation's history. They note it violates the Tenth Amendment, as the provision sets out how states use federal funds with regard to tax cuts. They say that's basically forcing states to relinquish control of their taxing authority, which is not allowed under the Tenth Amendment. The lawsuit also accuses the federal government of violating the conditional spending doctrine and the anti-commandeering doctrine. The provision in question reads, a state or territory shall not use the funds provided under this section or transferred pursuant to this section to either directly or indirectly offset a reduction in the net tax revenue of such state or territory resulting from a change in law, regulation or administrative interpretation during the covered period that reduces any tax by providing for a reduction in a rate, a rebate, a deduction or credit or otherwise, or delays the imposition of any tax or tax increase. The complaint in the lawsuit alleges that the provision known as the federal tax mandate disables states from decreasing taxes on their citizens for a period of over three years. And in doing so, usurps the ability of the states to reduce their tax burdens. It also creates an impermissible chilling effect on the state's officials to do the same based on a threat that the federal government may claw back some or all of the state's share of funding from the virus relief package. And many of the attorneys general of those states had previously signed an open letter to Treasury Secretary Janet Yelling calling for clarification about the provision. They said the prohibition on indirectly offsetting tax breaks could also be read to prohibit tax cuts or relief of any stripe, even if wholly unrelated to and independent of the availability of relief funds. Yellen's response from March 23 reads in part, the limitation affects states' ability to retain only those federal funds used to offset a reduction in net tax revenue resulting from certain changes in state law adding it is well established that Congress may place such reasonable conditions on how states may use federal funding. But attorneys general's offices from Montana and West Virginia noted Yellen failed to place limits on the vague provision. This lawsuit is the latest in a slew of other actions taken by states against the Biden administration, claiming federal overreach. Now, let's turn to big tech. Over 500 million Facebook users could be compromised. This after hackers posted it online. Co-founder of an Israeli cybersecurity firm, Hudson Rock, Alan Gale, says the information appears to be the same set of Facebook-linked telephone numbers that has been circulating in hacker circles since January. 
It is being sold for a few dollars worth of digital credit on a well-known site for low-level hackers. Facebook said in a statement the data was very old and related to an issue that it had fixed in August of 2019. Business Insider first reported on the availability of the data set. According to the report, the set includes information spanning 106 countries from phone numbers, Facebook IDs, full names, locations, birth dates, and email addresses. And the 533 million exposed data includes over 32 million records of users in the U.S., 11 million on users in the U.K., and 6 million on users in India. Gail and some journalists who have seen the data dump say they have been able to match phone numbers of people they know. He warns that Facebook users should be on the lookout for possible social engineering attacks in the coming months. But this leak isn't news for Facebook, which has a track record of dealing with leaks. In 2018, the social media giant disabled a feature that allowed users to search for one another via phone number. That came after reports that the political firm Cambridge Analytica had access information on up to 87 million Facebook users without their knowledge or consent. And in December 2019, a Ukrainian security researcher reported finding a database with the names, phone numbers, and unique user IDs of more than 267 million Facebook users, nearly all U.S.-based, on the open Internet. It is unclear if the current data dump is related to this database. Now let's turn to another tech giant, YouTube. A quick update on the platform removing dislikes. YouTube has deleted about 2.5 million dislikes from videos on the official White House channel of President Joe Biden. That's according to data released by researchers who wish to remain anonymous. For at least two years, it's had a policy to remove likes and dislikes it considers spam. A spokesperson for YouTube did not go into detail about what constitutes spam. Now, according to the data, the White House has posted more than 300 videos. Those videos have gotten nearly 3.7 million dislikes, of which nearly 2.5 million were removed. The website's authors started tracking the engagement on January 26 and has published all the data as well as the methodology used to collect it, but wishes to remain anonymous. According to the data, YouTube is deleting close to 8,000 dislikes per video on average, but not a single like was removed. But the data found, even with the interventions, the videos have nearly six times more dislikes than likes on average. Without the intervention, that number would be 17 dislikes for one like. According to the data, sometimes large amounts of dislikes would be removed about once an hour, keeping the dislike count around the same. In other cases, it would be chopped down at once. And YouTube recently announced testing of a design that still includes the dislike button, but no longer shows the number of dislikes. YouTube says it is testing the feature because of feedback from creators. The company announced on Twitter, in response to creator feedback around well-being and targeted dislike campaigns, we are testing a few new designs that don't show the public dislike count. Adding, if you're part of this small experiment, you might spot one of these designs in the coming weeks. But what do you think? Let me know below. Thanks for tuning in to Deep Dive. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you soon.